When a new air defense system shows up on the battlefield, it doesn't just add a weapon, it changes the math of survival. That's exactly what's happening now as Swedish-made Trident MK2 systems begin to move toward Ukrainian units. Before we dive in, make sure to like this video and subscribe to Combat Tech Zone. Stay updated with real battlefield tech, global defense insights, and breaking updates. This isn't a single new radar or an iconic missile battery arriving with fanfare. It's a deliberate capability intended to plug a very specific hole in modern defenses, cheap, massed aerial threats. Russia's playbook in recent years has emphasized saturation attacks with drones, cruise missiles, and low-flying munitions. Tactics that can bleed a defender's high-end interceptors dry and leave cities, supply lines, and frontline positions vulnerable. Trident May K2 isn't meant to replace systems like Patriot or NASAMS. It's meant to do the grinding, the everyday work, to be the reliable, sensible middle layer that makes more expensive systems effective by saving them for the big threats. What makes a system like the Tridon MK2 relevant to Ukraine now is not a single flashy stat, but a combination of practical attributes. First, it is optimized for volume. It can put a steady, precise stream of fire against multiple inbound targets. Second, it is mobile. Mounted on a hardened vehicle, it moves with units and can relocate rapidly after engaging, which matters against counter-battery strikes and loitering munitions. Third, it comes with modern fire control and sensor integration. The gun alone is useful, but the real power is the sensor-to-shooter loop. When a radar, electro-optical trackers, and command and control share a common picture and program, each round's fuse in milliseconds before launch, the outcome in a contested sky becomes very different. At the heart of Triton's appeal is the marriage of a high-rate 40mm gun with programmable ammunition and modern targeting. That combination means you're not trying to score impossible single-shot hits on small, fragile drones or unsophisticated cruise missiles. Instead, you create lethal volumes of effect in the right place at the right time. Programmable airburst rounds, set to detonate at precise distances, strip thin-skinned, UAVS or fragment incoming munitions into ineffective scrap. The economics are simple and brutal. A smart 40mm round costs a small fraction of a missile. And when tens or hundreds of cheap drones are launched, the math favors defenders who can match cost to effectiveness. As a tactical layer, Trident is the system commander's call when they want to stop attrition, to prevent their best missiles and launchers from being wasted on swarms of loitering munitions. But the hardware is only one part of the story. The supporting sensors and networking are equally critical. A gun without reliable detection and tracking is little better than a billboard. Trident MAK-2 deployments to Ukraine come as part of a package that emphasizes radar handoff, electro-optical surveillance, and integrated command nodes. That means the gun can be cued by a distant radar detecting an approaching swarm at long range, then fine-tracked by local sensors so the fire control computer can program fuses with the accuracy needed for an airburst at the precise intercept point. In contested electromagnetic environments, where jamming and spoofing are routine, that integration pays off. Redundant sensors, passive detection options, and hardened data links amplify the usefulness of the gun without requiring an endless parade of software patches or special parts. Mobility is another practical feature that changes the calculus. A static gun is a tempting target. A mobile system can fight and fade, using terrain and movement to complicate enemy targeting. Trident's truck-mounted concept lets it support fast-moving formations, reposition to protect critical infrastructure, or be deployed to defend an urban center on short notice. In Ukraine, where front lines shift and where Russian strike campaigns deliberately try to lure air defenses into exposing themselves, mobility buys life. It forces adversaries to pay a higher operational price. Before they can neutralize an air defense node, they have to locate it, pin it down, and expend munitions. And mobility increases the cost and time of that sequence. The ammunition's programmability is itself a tactical revolution compared to unguided shells. Modern programmable fuses can be set milliseconds before firing via a muzzle programmer or an electronic interface in the magazine. That tiny instruction a few dozen bytes, tells the round how long to fly before it bursts or whether to detonate at proximity or after a delay that maximizes effects against certain targets. The operator can choose an airburst mode for small drones and loitering munitions, a point detonate for hard-bodied threats, 
or a delayed mode to let the round penetrate light structures first. That flexibility makes each magazine worth many different missions, and it means the crew can adapt on the fly as the threat environment changes from small quadcopters to subsonic cruise missiles to light attack helicopters. From a logistics standpoint, this approach is a game of balance. Programmable 40mm rounds are more expensive than dumb steel projectiles, but a single guided missile is orders of magnitude more costly. A rational defensive doctrine preserves the high-cost interceptors for the very highest value threats. Ballistic missiles, heavy cruise missiles, or aircraft that pose strategic risk. While allowing systems like Trident to chew through disruptive but low-cost assault waves, that cost hierarchy makes defense sustainable over long conflicts because it preserves budgets and keeps attrition rates in check. Of course, we must be clear-eyed about limitations. No 40mm gun will reliably stop a supersonic anti-ship missile, and programmable rounds still need a coherent sensor picture to be effective. Electronic warfare, chaff, decoys, and sophisticated maneuvering can complicate interceptions. Fragmentation effects over populated areas demand careful rules of engagement. Commanders must manage collateral risk when airbursting ammunition above towns. Additionally, crews require training to master the sensors, understand the right fuse modes for different threats, and coordinate with the wider air defense network. Sweden's transfer of Trident capabilities to Ukraine includes not just hardware, but training packages, simulation aid, and doctrine sharing, precisely because the system's full value is unlocked in the hands of well-prepared crews working within a larger integrated defense. Strategically, Sweden's decision to field Trident MK2 to Ukraine carries layered messages. First, it is practical solidarity, a partner providing not only high-end assets but systems that directly reduce erosion from daily drone attacks. Second, it is political, Sweden signaling its willingness to equip Ukraine with modern, battlefield-relevant tools and to do so in a way that complements the mix of Western systems already fielded. Third, it expresses a tactical philosophy that recognizes attrition warfare as a long-term contest in which sustainability, affordability, and adaptability matter more than singular headline-grabbing platforms. Supplying tens of smart shells, a handful of mobile guns, and the networking needed to make them lethal is, in plain terms, a force multiplier. How might Russia respond? In the immediate term, tactical adjustments by Russian forces are likely. If Trident Mike K2 proves effective at a broad scale, Moscow can be expected to refine its swarm tactics. Varying altitudes, creating mixed attack profiles, timing launches to jam and saturate sensors, and prioritizing breakthroughs against less defended axes. They may escalate intelligence-gathering efforts to identify and strike Trident units using standoff weapons. They could also increase electronic attack measures to disrupt the sensor-to-shooter chain, or attempt decoy deployments to waste defenders' programmable rounds. In parallel, Russia may push to develop countermeasures specifically tailored to defeat programmable fuse, obscurance, kinematic unpredictability, or hardened design to survive fragment clouds. Yet those responses will cost time and money, which is precisely the strategic benefit the defender seeks. If a side has to switch tactics frequently and invest in more complex counters, it reduces the tempo and sustainability of its offensive operations. In other words, Trident's goal is strategic friction, to make every Russian drone wave less decisive, more costly, and less efficient. Integration with Ukraine's existing air defense architecture is the other critical factor. Kyiv's defense is a mosaic. Legacy Soviet systems, modern Western missiles, mobile SAMs, and ad hoc CIAD layers assembled under wartime pressure. Trident MEG-2 fills a mid-tier capability gap where many old guns and systems are inefficient or insufficient. To maximize impact, these systems must talk to each other. Radars must hand off tracks to gun batteries, command nodes must assign priorities, and operators must know when to preserve missiles and when to burn programmable shells. Sweden's assistance, therefore, emphasizes not just hardware transfer, but the software of defense, command doctrine, integration protocols, and logistics chains that keep the ammunition flowing. That combination gives Ukrainian commanders tactical options previously unavailable, a layered defense that is resilient, economical, and flexible. There is also an important human element. Introducing a new system into an active theater is not plug-and-play. 
Crews need time to practice, to internalize the nuances of fuse selection, to master cross-queuing between radar and optical tracking, and to learn how to fight and move under threat of counterattack. Sweden's training assistants, instructors embedded with Ukrainian units, live fire exercises and simulation tools shortens this learning curve. But still, the early weeks of deployment will be a sensitive period. Success will depend on rapid feedback loops, field reports flowing back to engineers in Sweden to refine software, adjust sensor thresholds, or tweak fuse profiles to counter observed behaviors. Politically, Tridon's arrival is another data point in the larger narrative of Allied support. Not every contribution needs to be headline-making missiles or aircraft. Sometimes what matters most is the steady supply of the right tools that reduce attrition and save infrastructure. For domestic audiences in support of countries, this approach can be more palatable. Funds buy measurable survivability rather than expensive platform prestige. For Kiev, it means a pragmatic step toward battlefield endurance. Finally, we should consider the long arc. If systems like Trident MK2 prove their worth in Ukraine, we may see a broader shift in how militaries think about layered defense in contested environment. Affordable, networked gun systems with smart munitions, combined with costlier missiles reserved for high-value threats, create a durable, flexible architecture. That model addresses the modern reality where adversaries use low-cost means to inflict disproportionate damage. The future of air defense may well be less about single system supremacy and more about a mosaic of layered complementary tools that together deny freedom of action to attackers. That's the strategic promise Sweden is betting on and the practical expertise Ukraine is trying to harness. Trident MKID 2 alone does not guarantee safety, nor will it magically erase the challenges of contested airspace, but it is an intelligent, cost-aware response to a specific problem. It is the kind of weapon that saves cities by being sensible, mobile, networked, economical, and lethal enough to force adversaries to change their calculus. As the Tridon units integrate, train, and fight alongside Ukrainian crews, the system's real test will be sustained operations under pressure. If it holds up, it won't be because of a single design feature, it will be because of doctrine, logistics, training, and the simple alignment of a weapon to a real battlefield need. In the end, the Trident MK2 is not just a piece of Swedish engineering. It represents a shift in thinking, a philosophy of defense rooted in practicality and sustainability. For too long, Ukraine and its allies have faced the dilemma of spending millions to intercept drones that cost only thousands. Every Patriot missile fired at a Shahed may save lives but it also drains resources in a war where both sides are counting every dollar and every day. The Trident EMK-2 flips that logic. Instead of trading gold for scrap metal, it provides a tool that makes sense in the mathematics of modern conflict. Use smart, mobile, affordable systems to counter cheap, mass threats. That is the essence of attrition warfare, making each wave of the enemy more costly and less effective than the one before. This is why the Tridon's arrival matters so deeply. Its 40mm programmable rounds, its ability to move with frontline units, and its relatively low operating cost make it more than a gun on wheels. It becomes a philosophy in motion. The goal is not to build an invincible shield. No system can promise that. But to ensure that Russia pays more and gains less each time it tries to overwhelm Ukraine's skies with drones or cruise missiles. Attrition is not glamorous. It is not the dramatic explosion of a hypersonic missile intercepted mid-air, but it is the slow, grinding reality of survival and eventual victory. What this also signals is an evolution in the kind of help allies are sending. In the early days of the war, support often carried symbolic weight. Tanks, jets, or one-off deliveries meant to show solidarity. But symbolism does not stop drones at 3 a.m. over a Ukrainian city. Systems like the Trident MK2 are different. They are not designed to grab headlines, but to solve problems, to close gaps, to make Ukraine's patchwork air defense stronger, smarter, and more sustainable. Piece by piece, this creates not just short-term survival, but long-term resilience. And that resilience is the true measure of meaningful aid. Ukraine does not only need weapons to fight today, it needs an ecosystem to withstand tomorrow. The Trident MK2 fits into that picture perfectly. It fills the middle layer between the expensive missile interceptors and the improvised gun trucks, ensuring that every threat has a tailored response. In doing so, it reduces waste, saves lives, and keeps Ukraine in the fight without exhausting its arsenal. 
When we discuss this system, it is worth remembering that it is more than just a Swedish export or a clever piece of battlefield technology. It is a message, a sign that Ukraine's partners are moving beyond symbolism and into strategy. They are no longer just sending weapons, they are building a defense that lasts. And in a war of attrition, that might be the most powerful support of all. If you found this helpful breakdown, hit like and subscribe for ongoing updates as these systems are fielded and battlefield lessons emerge. Combat Tech Zone will be tracking Trident MK2's deployment, combat performance, and the adjustments both sides make in response. And I'll bring the analysis straight to you as events unfold.